It's rupture. Um, I'm not a programmer like most of you. My, uh, my interest in this is uh, as a designer. I've been working in virtual worlds for, for a little while, a couple of years. And uh, I've been sort of connected to, uh, to Croquet and Cobalt for a little while yet, uh, for a little while now. Um, I think it has great potential and I try to help promote it. That's more or less what I'm doing here today. Um, there are a number of people who have been working on it over the years, but I do believe it's some, reaching something of a critical mass. And I wanted to try and uh, bring that across, hopefully, to get more people interested. The other thing I've done is I've organized, I've set up an organization called the Eduverse. It's a foundation here in, uh, in Amsterdam. And I promote also things in virtual environments, and I have symposia. And I've started working with an organization called Surfnet here in the Netherlands. And I'm extremely interested in trying to get them involved in promoting Croquet as well, that is, building environments. They also have, to some extent, some funding. So if there's anybody here who's interested in, uh, in possibly working on a project at some point and is involved in, in Croquet or can use weak uh, capabilities and so on, and are, is interested, please get in touch with me because I, you're a very specific and uh, uh, rare community. And I need to try and get access to as many of the people here who have some skills as possible. Uh, so right now I'm going to link up and then, uh, so I'll just call uh, uh, the presentation that will be given, will be given by uh, Julian Lombardi. Um, I don't know if, does everybody know who he is? Does anybody not know who he is? He's the head of, uh, of Croquet at uh, Duke University. And so he's, uh, he's pretty much running the, the Croquet Cobalt, but uh, I'll let him explain that. This is also something that I do to create a presence for people. I've split up uh, the screen. So Julian has his presentation on one side and, uh, well, a giant 1984-ish kind of head uh, on the other. So you get some sense of where he is. And if there's any questions, any questions that happen uh, that, that you've done, you'll ask them through me. Normally there's a separate microphone for it, but uh, we'll set it up so that, uh, that I'll, I'll just re-ask the question. But we can wait till the end the, of the of the of the presentation for that. Okay, uh, I'd like to present you Julian Lombardi, uh, head of uh, Croquet and uh, Cro uh, Cobalt. So, Julian, please uh, take it away. Thank you, thank you. I understand I have a half hour, and so in this time, uh, I'm going to take you for a tour through the Croquet and Cobalt projects, um, and uh, hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end for questions. Um, and what, I'll, what I'd like to do first, however, is to uh, point out that I'm unable to see anyone in the room. Uh, I cannot interact with you. Um, I want to interact with you, but the technologies that we have limit my ability to do so. Uh, and so the Croquet Project really was devised as a way of addressing that issue. The issue being that the computers that we have today are really far different uh, than they were 20 to 30 years ago when our current operating systems were designed and, and developed. The operating systems that have given us the user interfaces that we currently use presently. Today's computers are more media devices than they are computational devices. We use them for communication like, like we're doing right now with Skype and a combination of Adobe Connect. And we're doing so on top of legacy software and we're using, with, with respect to Adobe Connect, proprietary software to enable us to share an experience online. Um, it's basically very cumbersome. So what we tried to do with the Croquet Project is ask the question, if we could go back 20 to 30 years and do it over again, knowing what we know today, what would we do differently in terms of developing an information system, a system of communication, that could support deep collaboration between multiple people. And the Croquet Project was the answer to that. So today's machines have processing capabilities that far outstrip the capabilities of machines 20 to 30 years ago. We have fantastic graphics processors. 
CPUs, we have network connectivities that are essentially ubiquitous. And so what can we do with all of that? So another interesting problem, and let me know, uh, Robert, if you can see the new screen here. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just coming up. It's there now. <coughs> another interesting problem is that we have been dealing with user interfaces that are essentially windowing systems. Designed back in Xerox Park. Uh, Alan Kay had a lot to do with the current state of the overlapping Windows interface. Uh, and what we have now is the office metaphor that drives our interaction with computers. But now that computers for media devices, that office metaphor, that office desktop metaphor, is a place that we cram in the interaction with people. Um, and we have done so uh, through services such as you see here, America Online, CompuServe, and Prodigy, the services that we had during the uh, late 1980s. Um, we essentially put people in lists. The problem with these services was that, um, if we can go back to the late 1980s, the problem with the services is that these services are essentially walled gardens. They are computational environments and social environments that are produced by companies for consumption by their customers. Uh, in the old days, um, America Online, if you were a user, uh, you couldn't email people in CompuServe or Prodigy. You had to only interact with the community that was created for you. Now, this is the, the past that was essentially comprised of walled gardens. Um, and today, I would contend that we have essentially the same situation when it comes to 3D immersive virtual worlds that can support the interaction between people. Um, so a lot can be gleaned if we look back at the history of how our user interface developed, the one that we use now primarily of the web, and see where we might be able to follow the trends that have occurred in the past and, and help develop 3D environments and 3D capabilities based on what we've learned from the past. So one of the big innovations that happened um, after AOL, CompuServe, and Prodigy was the appearance of Gopher. What Gopher allowed you to do was to have anyone publishing information. Anyone could put up essentially a Gopher server. It was open, it was easily accessible, uh, it came well documented, and anybody could put up a Gopher server, and anyone could share a link to a Gopher resource with anyone else. And consequently, we have the development of what is essentially an emergent property, the emergent property of Gopher space, uh, the precursor essentially to the World Wide Web, where people could easily create, easily provision content, and easily consume content on a global scale information resource. A very significant event. Now what happened as the web, um, and in the early 1990s, again, the web had non-commercial origins, as did Gopher, extremely scalable and efficient for the 2D kind of information that you could access. Uh, the distributed content could be easily accessed by people, and easily provisioned by people. Basically, any idiot could put up a website, and any idiot did. Uh, and then anyone could access those websites, and we therefore had the explosive proliferation of a global scale information space. <coughs> the thing that made the web really, really powerful was the hyperlink. The idea of taking hypermedia, text-based hypermedia, and applying it to the two-dimensional structure of the web page, making it possible for the magic of that little blue word. You remember the little blue word the first time you saw it? You clicked on it, and then you got more information, a new site. And then you realize that, gee, I could make that information, and I could make the links. And then what, we, what, what essentially happened was the individual creativity of people all over the world could be tapped into. And so we had essentially the emergence of 
that self-optimizing, that developing information space that we know today as the World Wide Web. Unfortunately, the World Wide Web was and is essentially based on the metaphor of the document. It's a very good way of conveying brochures. In fact, architecturally, it's designed to be a one-to-many system, stateless and involving the transmission of document structures. So the web is very efficient and very good at allowing us to take text and two-dimensional graphics and putting it on the page. But the web has some serious limitations when it comes to supporting the kinds of interactions that we're attempting to do here with this conference, uh, supporting the kinds of interactions between people on an ad hoc basis involving more than just the conveyance of two-dimensional information or text data. Um, before windowing, we had the C prompt. And I remember looking at the C prompt and saying, C is greater than what, uh, when I looked at it. You had to have a foreknowledge of the information that, you know, that was relevant to your interaction with the C prompt. Windows and windowing made it possible for you to see the choices that you have in interacting with the computer. Essentially, you see menus, you could click on them, and launch applications. Um, and the power of the web is that it leveraged that. But now, essentially, the interface to the web has become what you see in front of you. I like to refer to this as the G prompt. There's a tremendous body of information out there. But a user who gets to it doesn't really understand what's out there because they're not exposed to it contextually. Google is a great search engine for accessing information that you want to have, but sometimes you don't know what you want to have. Um, I had somebody lament to me that with the online catalog system at the, the university library here, they didn't have the ability to explore the stacks of books in the library. And that in the past, that was a very important way of gaining a situation and awareness of a particular discipline or a particular set of pursuits. You would just happen onto the rich resources in a well-stocked library. Today, we can't do that very well because we have no way of conveying the context of information. And this is where 3D comes in. Now, one of the problems with the web, and one of the problems that we address with the Croquet Project, which I will get to, is that the web is delivered by replication of data. Essentially, you have a web server, and you have content. And that content is requested by a client. Give me some information, and it gets the information, and then you display the information. So essentially, a web page is displayed on a client. Right. Everybody knows this. What happens, though, is that there is an efficiency in this respect when a lots of clients ask for resources episodically. So here you have lots of clients asking episodically for a bit of information from the server. And the server is able to accommodate those requests to, to a reasonable degree. So that's how the web works, by replication of data. But now if we want to start to convey the power of context, essentially showing all of the books in the library, and going even a step further, showing all of the patrons of the library, where you bump into somebody in your section of the library that might have a, a similar interest, essentially the power of context, then we have to start looking at the architectural limitations of the web, because by replicating data, we don't efficiently, or we cannot efficiently, or even reasonably, support the needs of multi-user online virtual environments. Let me illustrate this for you. Things like Second Life and other <coughs> virtual contexts that are essentially delivering the full presence of other people within the context of information resources, which is what they're doing. It's very exciting, because essentially we're seeing the birth of a meta-medium here. The problem with the existing technologies 
is that they are reliant on replication of data. Again, that is a problem. So essentially, when you have a virtual world, the virtual world is served by a server, the virtual world server seen here, and you have a virtual world on that server. Now, a client that wants to access that virtual world has to get information about everything that's happening on that virtual world. Essentially, any process that's taking place on that virtual world needs to be communicated to the client all the time, continuously. This is not like the web page, where you ask for a page and you get it, and then you spend a lot of time reading it. There's no further connectivity required. With virtual worlds, the requirements of connectivity are phenomenally larger than they are for the web. And therefore, we have a tremendous load that's applied on the server. So when you have multiple clients, the load on the server becomes very great. Uh, so for example, Second Life, let's take Second Life, or not just Second Life, any server-based virtual world technology. Um, it's about 20 to 30 people per processor uh, is what those servers can support. So if you have 20 to 30 people using Second Life or another virtual world application, you have to basically stand up a dedicated server to support the needs of that community. And that's a very expensive proposition, and one that doesn't fly very well, because what we want to do with the Procade project is make virtual world collaboration and deep collaboration in virtual worlds available to everybody. And when I say everybody, I mean millions of people interacting in virtual contexts. And if we do that, we have to overcome the server problem. The server problem is an interesting one, though because the companies that provide virtual world technologies make their money off of the server resource. And they essentially put it in terms of, um, well, I, I won't go down that rabbit hole right now. But basically, the funding model is based on the reliance of virtual worlds on servers. And so companies have to find a way to monetize those servers. And this is all because of the general architecture that involves the replication of data. So what we're doing with the Croquet project is something a little bit different. Rather than loading up those servers and having to essentially build new servers, and then figure out how to charge people for those servers by leasing land or by subscription or by the many other mechanisms that are currently out there. We're basically saying, let's, let's rethink the problem. And we rethink the problem by, instead of, instead of doing what we did before by replicating data, we replicate. So essentially at the heart of Croquet, and Cobalt, which is the application we're building on Croquet, is the notion of replication of computation. So what we do is we have a client. When a client has a virtual on it and it needs to coordinate with another client, it basically holds in synchrony any computation that happens on the client. So basically, you have a version, the other person has a version, and only when you change something in your version do you send a message to the other saying that you want to change something. So basically, it's replicated computation that is distributed via a peer-to-peer -peer mechanism. And so as such, you can have lots of clients or lots of computers, I should say, holding a, an equivalent state in a computation through a peer-to-peer -peer messaging protocol known as T-Time. And of course, this scales out, as does any peer-to-peer -peer technology. Um, and so in this way, uh, you can have lots of these people who are in virtual worlds held in synchrony, that is, computational synchrony, that allows them to share a computational experience without the need to rely on a server for, or a server infrastructure to do so. 
this becomes scalable. If we wanted to deploy, for example, virtual world technologies in support of kindergarten through 12th grade education in the United States alone, we would probably have to build several more power plants and data centers to support that need at great expense. If we use the model of replicated computation, all we need to do is maintain network. And this is fundamentally threatening to the business models that are developing around virtual worlds. And this is precisely where we're going with the Croquet Cobalt project. Now, you might say, well, if it's all peer-based, then what happens if, if uh, everybody shuts off their peers? What happens to the world? Um, well, what we're proposing, and what we're doing here at Duke University now, is we are essentially taking a snapshot of the world uh, at intervals and storing it to a, to a storage device uh, so that we can always bring it back up again if there is an interruption. Um, like, and also, if there's an interruption with one of the clients, all they need to do is to, when they come back on, uh, ask what the latest messages are, the messages since they were last connected. Uh, they get those messages from any one of the other clients, and then they bring their state of computation up to the state of the collective, essentially. If everybody drops out, what we'll do is, here at Duke University, we'll maintain a participant, not a server, but a participant in that simulation, which then can be referred to, backed up and referred to by other clients when they return. So when a client returns, it says, give me a snapshot of the current state of simulation. Boom, it gets a snapshot, and then it establishes the peer-to-peer -peer connection to maintain synchrony with the computation. So that's basically how it works. Um, so there's a couple of things that are important here. One is that this is extremely scalable and cost effective. Uh, and because it's built on Croquet Squeak, it's multi-platform and multi-device. will support multiple platforms and multiple device. Uh, it's also, uh, by virtue of the development environment, it's open and flexible. Um, it, we are developing modular integration with existing systems. We're integrating VNC, for example, so that you'll be able to bring up, up sessions that are running on other machines on the network in your Croquet spaces. And we are ensuring here, through the funded uh, activities here at Duke University, that we will have secure support for education and scholarship. That is, we will be able to provide open source technologies that can be used to have secure access to virtual worlds of your creation for purposes of education or any other purposes, because we're going to make this available, and we are making it available, open under the MIT-style license to the entire world. The motivations that we have are around doing virtual worlds are around experimentation, believing that something's there, uh, and this is true for most people who use virtual worlds. So today's most second life users are, uh, who are using it for serious purposes are essentially um, just trying to understand what this new medium provides. Institutional motivations are very different from individual motivations, and they are the motivations that drive our work with the Croquet Project. We're funded now by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and by the National Science Foundation to develop scalable, interoperable, uh, virtual world technologies that can be deployed readily and openly that allow us to avoid the vendor lock-in that happens. You know, did you know that when you build something in Second Life, you have intellectual property rights to that thing that you build, but only in Second Life? You can't pull that out of Second Life without violating the agreement. Um, so one of the things that, that we want to do is to ensure that since Second Life is like today's AOL, CompuServe and Prodigy, uh, all of the virtual world technologies out there tend to be restricted the way the early online services were. What we want to do with Croquet is take it to the level of Gopher and take it to the level of what the web did 
in supporting a large-scale distributed information system, but doing so from the standpoint of a core technology that supports three-dimensionality and social co-presence in a stateful way. Right? Because when we have that, when we have that, um, when we have that synchrony, that simultaneous computation, what we're essentially doing is saying that the core of the system is based on stateful interactions rather than stateless interactions such as the web. And that's because we've designed the system to support deep interaction. And in so doing, it has to be stateful. Um, and so by having a stateful technology, we overcome all kinds of problems. Um, there's a number of other reasons why we're doing this. But primarily to support virtual organizations, to support organizations and their ability to expand the interactions between people over space and time. And of course, the other reason that we're doing this, and doing this through croquet, small talk based croquet, is that we very much believe in openness and we want to change the basic state of computation. On a, on a global scale. So, um, that may sound grandiose and everything, but uh, it, it is our motivation. Uh, and so what we're hoping to do here is to build the technology that is essentially the next web, um, that incorporates the current web, but that is essentially equivalent to what the first web browser was to 2D. Uh, we're developing an open technology based on Squeak small talk that is designed to be the browser for 3D. So uh, with that, I will take you now to a demonstration. Now, what you see here. One second, uh, Julia. Last second. Yes. Okay. I'm not exactly sure what happened. You maybe put, may have put full screen and that changed the resolution. I don't know. Ask me if he said full screen. Yeah. See the screen now? Uh, yeah, just, uh, just, okay, I think we're good. Okay, yeah, very good. Yeah. So, what you see here now, uh, and I will play this movie and stop it as we go along here. Uh, what you see right now is a web browser uh, within the environment. Uh, this is a croquet demo uh, that we have, it's available online, um, and it is illustrating the basic functionality of the croquet system. All of what I'm showing you here is open source. Um, there, there is a commercial company that has developed that is commercializing uh, the okay technology in the form of a proprietary technology known as Quack, Quack Forums. Uh, several of the Croquet architects are pursuing that as a business. Uh, Mark McCahill and I primarily are leading the open source Croquet effort to ensure that high quality Croquet based technologies are available and uh, are able to be enhanced by community software development effort. Uh, what you see here is a demonstration of the capabilities of Croquet, and I'll actually bring Croquet up live in the form of Cobalt, which is an application that we're building on Croquet. This is simply a demonstration of some of the capabilities in Croquet. So here you see a web page in World. Uh, which means that the entire legacy content of the World Wide Web can be brought into Croquet. 
In fact, croquet can be the uh, output device or, or the, uh, the viewing device for any and all web content. Um, we also have the ability uh, to import avatars uh, based on um, uh, various open uh, uh, available avatar uh, uh, formats. Uh, and this is a new thing that we've just built into Croquet. Um, and here you have animated avatars. Uh, we also have voice over IP in Croquet as well. So voice over IP uh, and the Skype level of functionality is built into the technology at this point. Uh, we are taking all of these pieces and organizing them into a user interface. And that project is called the Cobalt Project, codenamed Cobalt right now. And what we, what we hope to have when we're done with Cobalt at the end of this uh, next year, that is over the next 12 months, uh, is a, an equivalent to a 3D browser to 3D spaces that can contain web spaces. This is an example of two users interacting, moving a window inside the croquet space. Uh, that window being moved by two users Keep in mind that it is not being done through the use of a, of a uh, server. This is based on peer-to-peer -peer, uh, and based on the fact that you have a bunch of messages that are timestamped that are executed in the order of the timestamps. Uh, so everybody creates a message as they wish. Those messages are essentially put into a long queue and they're executed. And that represents the, uh, the order of execution of the messages for all of the participants. Um, here in the next sequence, I'm going to be creating a new browser, essentially a new browser window, uh, bringing up the um, Scamper browser that some of you are familiar with. So here I'm bringing up a browser frame, Scamper, and that means that the creation of that browser, the creation of content, is to the publication of that content to other people who are in the space. Um, you can edit text collaboratively within the space. So one of the things that comes along for free when you, when you have stateful computation as the basis of your system is that anything that you do is collaborative. And what you have to do, instead of building collaboration into the system, you have to restrict how much people collaborate. So things like Adobe Connect that we're using right now are essentially designed to build collaborative capabilities on top of a stateless system, right? And Adobe sells that as a product. But if you had collaboration as the core of the system, you wouldn't have to do anything. Collaboration would just be there. And so I'll illustrate that for you here. The rabbit now, well, I didn't illustrate it very well. The rabbit can actually change the text and see the text change, and then I could change the text and watch that change. Um, another thing that happens here is that we can create new places. And the, the act of creating a new space or place is the act of publishing that new space to other people. Uh, so here you see a, a, a menu that was brought up, the creation of a new space, and that new space can be seen here inside a window. It's only in a window for convenience. A new space can actually be applied to any set of polygons in the sink. Um, but here, it is essentially a portal into another world. What makes that interesting is that that is essentially the equivalent of a 3D hyperlink. And anybody else who sees that portal, who has rights to see the portal, that's a whole other level of this, can actually do the equivalent of clicking on a little blue word. Essentially, they walk through. And so here, the rabbit is going from one world to another. And that is the analog of clicking on a hyperlink on a two-dimensional document and going to a new web page. But in the three-dimensional world, it is simply passage through the portal between the worlds. It's another world contained within this world. And the beauty of croquet is that we can create any number of portals in any number of worlds that are linked to each other. So essentially, you have the framework, 
the capability, the functionality that led to the development of the World Wide Web through the interlinking of documents, you now have a very capable and rich medium within which to interlink virtual worlds freely without the need to lease property, without the need to buy a subscription, by making available the Cobalt application at the end of next year, at the end in next summer, which is the plan, we will release a technology that can be used by people to create a rich environment, uh, an ecology of interlinked virtual worlds with limitless proportion. These worlds can be interconnected, so I'm going to walk now into the world. And another feature is the ability to mash up the worlds. So you could create a world, so the rabbit just created a world, and he's going to go in the world, and I'm going to grab that world now, and I'm going to carry it into another world. So I'll just carry that world out and put it out here. So in a sense, I'm able to arrange worlds, I'm able to rearrange worlds, and I can rearrange collections of worlds in ways that are just not possible using the currently available um, chat and entertainment-based technologies that are all the rage. Croquet is seeking to develop a technology infrastructure to support the proliferation of a metamedium space. Uh, that contains virtual worlds as easily as the web, in effect, contains web pages. Now, we can also access remote applications. So in this case, uh, I'm accessing the uh, Squeak chess game, um, and the rabbit just initiated that. So he basically launched the chess game, and now the chess game is being played collaboratively between me and the rabbit. So I can go over there and I can move the pieces, the rabbit can move the pieces. Now, some of you are familiar, no doubt, with this chess game. This was written for 2D, but look at it. It's in a 3D world. And it's very compelling as a 3D application now. Uh, this shows you how powerful it is, the ability to take third-party applications and project them into croquet spaces. Using BNC, we can project all kinds of applications from all kinds of other computers into collaborative, interactive spaces where people can communicate using voice over IP. It's actually quite powerful. So not only can we call up Squeak applications, but with VNC we can call up Windows. Hell, we can even call up the Linux desktop. We can even call up our own desktop in the world. And we can make that private world. So we're talking about a technology that's able to deliver virtual private spaces that could be your space for organizing all of your information. It could have, a meta, it, it could have a user interface proxies for everything that's in your windowing system in the space. So we're playing against the machine here, and I'm now moving the piece, and you get the idea. We can also visualize data. So with the right XML feed of data into the croquet simulation, we can represent numbers that are derived from calculations happening on third party computers. So for example, we could have a bunch of numbers that are coming off of a supercomputer in San Diego, for example, that are, that are resulting in the uh, visual output in the shared croquet space. And so multiple scientists could be analyzing that data as it's developed in real time by a supercomputer at another location. So essentially, croquet becomes the output metaphor for calculations that are happening remotely. Uh, so in this case, this is a sombrero function, and we could, we could visualize the whole sombrero function. And that function might change as the conditions change on the machine that's providing these uh, uh, numbers. So we don't need to do the local, we don't need to do calculations locally. We could use croquet as a output metaphor for calculations happening remotely. Um, we have developed some uh, demonstrations of 
remote control of objects within the space. So here I'm flying this little helicopter around. And this idea of avatars is a really interesting one. A lot of people have criticized the Croquet Project because we hadn't had good avatars for a long time. Uh, what we're working on um, is the ability to actually take the screen and run it in there. So here I'm taking a, uh, this is a, of course, a movie of a screen capture, uh, of a video capture, being projected directly into the croquet space. So why don't we just have it so that we can video conference directly in 3D environments, right? Um, and this becomes a very compelling way of communicating. Um, we have toyed with uh, a number of authoring technologies for content. Uh, the idea of being able to create content dynamically directly in the space is a good one. Uh, we are developing uh, importers for all the standard uh, 3D formats, so people could actually go in and collaboratively design and create content directly in the world. Uh, another example here is that we could also use the world to teach us how to create content directly in the world. So here's a, a tutorial on making a uh, fish swim, uh, making a fish. Uh, so here I'm just grabbing um, a palette here that allows me to build a fish. I'm going to build a fish and drawing the shark that will be in this world. And of course, the object-oriented nature of the uh, of the technology allows us to uh, be able to, once we create the shark here, now it's a 3D shark, it's in space. You could, have, you could have 10 or 15 people doing this at the same time, building the whole environment. Um, it also inherited the ability to, um, to have a menu. Uh, it could also inherit a swimming ability if we allowed it to do so. Swimming ability that was essentially inherited uh, derived from the fish that were swimming around in that space. Uh, being able to manipulate content together, being able to animate things. Uh, this is Flash running inside um, uh, a window. Um, you know, for those of you who have worked with Flash, you know that it doesn't undergo isometric deformation. Um, I mean, it only undergoes isometric deformation. Here we have Flash in perspective, which is a kind of a new thing. You can paint Flash on any set of polygons in the croquet space. Uh, which means that you could be flying through a croquet space that's completely derived from requests that are made on web servers uh, for uh, uh, JPEGs or, or Flash or whatever uh, you want to have paint the scene. Uh, and there's a whole, there's a whole story there. So basically, the rest of this is um, showing you the ability to annotate objects within the space. Again, these are all prototype implementations. Uh, we are now developing ways to create uh, an application that will serve the purposes of uh, education and uh, scientific discovery. This is a Mars rover simulation in the space. And that's basically it. So, that's an overview of Croquet. What I'm going to do now is bring up, uh, how many minutes do I have left, Robert? Um, actually, I don't know. Who's, uh, all of them. Huh? All of them. You have all of them. We're at the, we're at the, you have the last presentation, so uh, take the oh, time you good. need. As long as well, then I could talk forever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I already saw the fish. It's just a wish. <laughs> so take your time. OK. So um, I'll, I'll take another uh, five to 10 minutes here. Um, what I'm doing now is uh, showing you Cobalt. Um, Croquet has been uh, under development now for about four years, uh, maybe a little bit longer, depending on how you count. Um, and um, it has received funding from the National Institute of uh, Communication Technology in Japan, from Hewlett Packard. Uh, uh, a lot of work has been done by uh, the uh, Quack. Uh, contributions are made back to the open source by uh, all of these entities. University of Wisconsin, the University of Minnesota, and now Duke University are supporting activities, as well as National Science Foundation and the Mellon Foundation. 
Uh, and the goal here now with Croquet is to develop an open source application. We've built a software developer's kit, but that's very unsatisfying to a lot of people who are interested in the potential of this system. So what we're doing is we are building the application, um, which will allow anyone to create virtual spaces and interlink them with others. And this is the uh, very early pre-alpha build of that application. Uh, you're seeing the development environment here, uh, the, the COBOL desktop, uh, and you see in the window here uh, one of the newer avatars that we have, which has uh, 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 been nicely developed here. Um, what I'm going to do is functionality directly in the world. Uh, to make it easier for you, I will take this now to full screen. Can you see that all right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now I'm inside the world. What I did was I just brought in a JPEG uh, of, an, of a vintage Mac desktop. Remember that? And Cobalt is essentially trying to take Croquet and make it usable to end users. So some of the things that we're doing initially are to, this is a mirror here. So we have new avatars that are a little more compelling than the avatars we had before. The main piece about Cobalt is the menu here. So it's a very, we hope, familiar looking menu. It allows you to log in, and we're making that log in to our campus identity here at Duke University, and we'll make it available to others to log into whatever identity management system they have. We've divided the menu into people, places, and things, because those are the three main things that people deal with in virtual worlds. With people, we have the ability to have in-world chat. This is actually Jabber that's integrated into Cobalt. So a full-fledged Jabber client is in here. Jabber will also be leveraged and is being leveraged as a way of identifying other spaces. So just as you can see your friends on Jabber or the friends that you're authorized to see on a Jabber server, we're making it, we're modifying Jabber so that you'll be able to see the virtual worlds that you are allowed to see and that your friends want you to see on Jabber. So there'll be Jabber as a rendezvous server that will allow you to access other people in world or other worlds themselves that are currently active. So in this case, if I want to, I can go in here and type in something. And you'll see that what I say is in that window. But one of the nice things about Cobalt is that what we can do is with the Cobalt windowing system that we're currently working on, we're able to take windows and make them overlay the virtual world. So in this way, you notice there are little buttons in the lower right hand corner. So essentially a window contains a user interface. And so by leveraging the windowing technology, we can create user interface overlays onto virtual worlds with functionalities that the specific functionalities desired by end users. Which means you can make your own user interface very easily. 
So in this case, you can sort of get the idea of a head-up display here on top of a virtual world, which is navigable, and which people can, you know, explore, move around in. Right? So this is a very powerful but very simple way of approaching highly customizable virtual world uh, uh, implementations. Uh, we can link to active places. We can load new places from templates. We can load new templates from URLs. So here the idea is that we can leverage the infrastructure of the World Wide Web and, and servers that exist today as a way of allowing access to croquet worlds, either as live worlds accessible through Jabber or as worlds that are reposed in web repositories anywhere in the world. Uh, we have a terrain editor that's in the environment here. Um, we have a number of other tools that we're trying to consolidate in the space. We have the ability to save spaces. And the ability to publish spaces to specific directories. So again, what you're looking at here is something that will give you all the capabilities of other virtual world systems with none of the financial overhead. Uh, all you do is leverage the existing resources that you have. Julian, I, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt you, but uh, we're getting a, kind of a heads up that, um, that we're running short on time. There is something that has to be required, so um, okay. maybe just conclusion. I, I'm assuming there will be also some questions that people want to ask. So, uh, okay. Yeah, I'll leave it to you to, to, to run with you. So, so what I did here was just very quickly um, added a, um, a 3D object from a repository directly into the space. Uh, so here you see a turtle that has been placed into the space, and the turtle is editable, uh, it's explorable, it's editable, uh, I can modify it in the space. Uh, these are basic capabilities that are needed for uh, the creation of multi-user virtual worlds that anyone can deploy. Okay, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, uh, we have one. Uh, there's no microphone set up so that I can't... Any question you ask, I'm going to have to re-ask, so go ahead. Okay. Well, the question I had actually comes, interestingly enough, from the West. It's kind of virtual Skype and Skype at the work. Uh, guy I work with wanted to know whether the Croquet interface to OpenGL is going to face rewriting due to the deprecation of a bunch of stuff in the latest OpenGL 3.0. You're going to have to ask that question yourself. I'm not sure that I can. <laughs> <laughs> not not, not be uh, correct. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, well, you know how these things go. Yes, probably so at some point, but we're going to stick with the current version right now. Um, you know, it's a uh, uh, this will happen with OpenAL. It will happen with uh, Open Dynamics Engine. Uh, it even happens to a certain degree uh, around the uh, upgrades to the operating systems. Where we 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 are we will have to do that at some point. Uh, we should do it at some point, but right now we're focused more on getting this out the door over the next year. So, I hope that answers your question. Um, consider that we are very poorly funded right now, and we're very much relying on a community-based software effort. So, if there are any folks out there who would be interested in helping us with that, uh, I would be very much interested in speaking with you. You can use me to, to get in touch with him if you don't already have his, his email. All the information. Julian, what, what can you tell, yes. uh, basically one of the things I'd like to be able to get out of these guys, if, what can you tell them 
the, these, these uh, room full of programmers about uh, where Croquet is uh, and Cobalt are developing to try and get them interested in, let's say, a project that I would be working on for somebody, something here? How can you convince them? Right. Um, look, we think this is the next big thing, all right? Let's just be very candid about it. Um, if we are able to provide a reliable virtual world browser technology in the form of Cobalt, uh, the, there will be a tremendous interest in sweet small talk that will generate, we'll have, you know, hundreds if not thousands of new programmers looking very seriously at this very powerful technology that many of us already understand the power of, but, has not, but we have not enjoyed the sort of marketing muscle uh, of the Suns and the, and the other companies that have advanced far less capable technologies. Um, and so uh, I believe that with the successful implementation of Cobalt, uh, a simple browser tool doing what I'm showing you here that is, that is hardened, cleaned up, uh, and ready for prime time, I believe that we will uh, make a major contribution to the advancement of, uh, you know, of, of the sweet small talk community. Um, so what what we've done is we've set up the Croquet Consortium, and within the Croquet Consortium, we've set up a project called Cobalt. And I would very much welcome uh, folks to help us develop the roadmap. This is a community-based effort. This used to be a very top-down project. Uh, it is not anymore. Uh, we are working very hard to develop a uh, a, a community-based approach to what you see here. This is not one person's vision. This is a collective vision of the 12 or so people who are now actively involved with COBOL's development. Um, and I would very much welcome uh, any of the programmers in, 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 in this conference who are interested in something that is open, open, open um, to, to, to take part in this project uh, and to help us uh, set direction. There's a lot of things that need to be done. We've developed a roadmap that's available on the Croquet Consortium website. That's croquetconsortium.org. Uh, and under Cobalt, you will see uh, a, a roadmap of the 20 main things that we think we need to do. Um, but already there have been other contributors who are contributing other very important technologies. For example, there's a group out of Malaysia that is integrating FreeCAD into Croquet right now. Uh, it wasn't on our roadmap, but it's what they thought was necessary. And we absolutely welcome and applaud that effort. Uh, there are other groups that are working on various other things. Um, too many to mention here in the short time we have left, but if anyone here is interested in contributing to this, to the vision of what we're trying to do here, essentially doing the next big thing, uh, we greatly welcome your participation. This is an international project. Uh, it is not owned by anyone. Um, the Croquet Consortium was designed to provide a legal home for the open source technology to hold the liabilities around the technology. I get an angry uh, look from, basically from, the, from one of the organizers. Um, okay. <laughs> You, I saw the did you? I know we're over. Half an hour, only half an hour? Good. Uh, is it quick? Is it a quick question? I hope so. Sure. A short answer. Also. Yeah. I've seen some uh, vision from the Mozilla Aurora project. Mozilla Aurora. Where they effectively showed the uh, similar same thing when two people um, directly uh, work together with some website. They. Um, they both took, took control over a website that they uh, synchronously saw and manipulated. Uh, can you shed some words upon this? Uh, I think that's going to be too complex of the time that we okay. have. But uh, let, if I could discuss it with you. And like I said before, okay. um, so, uh, well, I'll bid goodbye to Julie for the first. Thanks, Julie. Much appreciated. Um, Thank you all. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, what I wanted to say was
is that uh, if there's anybody else who's interested, I really would like to speak to some to the programmers, people who are interested in getting into projects, anybody basically. So, or even questions, maybe if I can't answer them, I can maybe, maybe find a way to get them answered. Thanks very much. Cheers.